I run music festivals and I'm the founder and festival director of Love Supreme Festival in Sussex. I'm one of the co-founders and an editor here at Tortoise. I'm one of the co-founders of Tortoise. I'm an editor and partner at Tortoise Media. It's actually the creative collaboration of a team of people who put on great music festivals and a team of people uh, that you know because you backed us on Kickstarter before building a new type of newsroom. I think there's really a thirst for knowledge and discourse, but there's also a thirst for feeling and experience. And bringing together an ideas festival with a music festival, I think, can help satisfy that desire. It is going to be a completely different festival. Ours is really built around the idea that something is fundamentally changing in the way in which we all live. We're much more activist, we're much more passionate. And so what we want to do is give people a chance to really engage with the people, the politicians, the business leaders, the cultural icons who are shaping the way we live, to engage with them in conversation, not just sit and listen, but really engage with them. And in the way in which you do at a festival for music, you're part of the show, we want that to be the case when it comes to ideas. Challenges ahead of us like AI, climate change, uh, population growth, um, belonging and what it means to be part of a community. Beautiful surroundings, great food, great artists, bars, the ability to camp or glamp. I'm definitely glamping. A mixture of, if you like, fireside chats and a big top. And we'll have a thinking village at Kite, which means that we'll have a series of tents and simultaneous thinkings going on. A celebration of great ideas, and then it goes on to a really great party at night with some amazing music. It's really the love child of hay and latitude. It's TED Talks meets So Far Sounds. The most important thing about who's involved in the festival is you, the Kickstarter community. As we shape the ideas for the festival, as we shape the music for the festival, your input will be more important than James's. So as a founder of the festival, you will always get the best price tickets, you will always hear about the festival first, but even when we're sold out, if you've been a founder, you'll always be able to get tickets. Help us to make sure that Kite flies.
you much, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, welcome to Tortoise and welcome to A Thinking. Um, my name's Polly Curtis, um, and tonight we've all come here to try and get a better understanding of what class means today. It's quite a popular subject, I can see from all these faces in the room. Um, so for those of you who haven't been to A Thinking, um, this conversation we have tonight is the engine of the journalism we do. So in trying to tackle this really big, complicated question, we're all contributing to the journalism that will come through um, the Tortoise newsroom. Um, so we have a few rules in the thinking. They're, they're not too many. The first one is that only I'm allowed to ask questions. We want to know what you all think, and we want to encourage you to share your ideas um, and add to our shared understanding of this subject. Um, the second one is that when you speak, put your hand up um, and introduce yourself. Um, let us know your name so we can get to know you, come back to you, um, and continue the conversation. And the last one is to introduce Agatha, who's our tortoise up there. Over the course of the hour, Agatha will move from left to right, and a flag goes up at the end, and that's our time mark. Um, so class feels kind of fashionable again. Um, people are talking about it. People wanted to come here to talk about it tonight. Um, and this is a really big change from where we were 20 years ago when New Labour was um, declaring that um, we're all middle class now. Um, and then we've had this 10 years of austerity and huge changes in our working conditions and then the whole thing over Brexit. And I feel personally that I don't understand class in this country anymore. It's kind of in everything we do, but I don't understand it anymore. And particularly when we have a prime minister now who talks about chavs and losers and burglars when he's referring to the bottom 20%. This is, this is quite a stark moment on class, but I don't get it. So we've come here to understand it better. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to introduce our fabulous guests who have joined us, who have kind of particular insights on this that we're going to share. But I wanted to start with a couple of shows of hands just to kind of get a sense of what people in the audience are thinking about this. Um, and um, this is quite cheesy, so bear with me. Um, who uses the word lounge? OK. Um, what about drawing room? <laughs> um, when you eat around the middle of the day, who has dinner? Dinner? Lunch? Lunch. Um, who goes to the toilet? Who goes to the lavatory? Only my grandma. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean that. <laughs> um, and who sits on a couch? Who sits on a sofa? Who thinks judging people by what vocabulary they use is utter bollocks? Who thinks it actually tells you something about the person you're meeting? Who would admit, this is the last one, I'm not going to take the whole hour, um, who would admit that they look for signals of class when they meet someone new and they're making an assessment of the person they're meeting? That's really interesting. So that list actually came from um, the Nancy Mitford um, essay from 1954. Um, called the U versus non-U vocabulary that caused this huge row in which the kind of middle classes tried to change their vocabulary to be, be more upper class. Um, and there's this lovely quote that I think we've got up here, which was Evelyn Moore's response. Um, These subjects are too intimate for print, surely. There are subjects too intimate for print, surely class is one. Um, not in this room. Um, so what does class mean today? I'm going to ask Professor Geoffrey Evans first, who's a professor of politics at the University of Oxford and knows a little bit about this. Can you, can you kind of give us the basic definition of class? Uh, incredibly difficult question. I could spend the next hour just trying. Basic. You've got two minutes. Yeah. Um, 
what, what most academics and, and the um, Office for National Statistics use is your occupation, and they classify your occupation according to whether it's got certain attributes to do with skill and, and, and qualifications and control and autonomy and, and all sorts of attributes which are good, and things like whether or not you've got the ability to, whether you've got guaranteed promotion prospects, say, or um, pensions and job security, uh, and whether you have a sense of autonomy, and lots of other things about jobs, and they cluster them into what used to be called, like, you know, professional managerial, and then, like, routine non manual, and then, like, foreman, and then working, manual working class. And they tend to drop the word manual because manual doesn't really capture jobs very well, like, in a call center, although the conditions of employment are not that different from a factory would have been back in the 70s in terms of your, your say in the job and what you actually do. So they're basically the desirability of jobs in terms of what they give you in terms of resources. Um, obviously, money is part of it, but it's not all of it. And one of the key things is that some jobs have built in them the expectation of continued increase in salary throughout the life cycle. You know, they have promotion. If you're a junior doctor, you may not earn a brilliant amount, but by the time you're 40 or 50, you're going to be earning stack loads, and this is expected. Um, other jobs peak when you're about 22, and you actually probably earn less in your 50s because they're physical and demanding, and you probably can't keep them, and you've lost them, and that to go and take a less skilled job, etc. So that sort of trajectory throughout the life cycle separates a lot of jobs out, and it's being in a, in a, in a, in a professional path versus being in a pretty disadvantaged and relatively unstable. And Jeffrey, unstable how long situation. has that system been used for? Uh, well, I mean, that's been around for decades. Mm -hmm. They tweak it because jobs change titles. And does it still work? It works in the sense that it really picks up on things like your educational attainment, your health, how much you earn, your um, attitudes to some things, but mainly resources and, and prospects for your kids and things like that. And so all those important objective things are still quite strongly related. The fact there's been no real sign of decline in the relationship between class position and those sorts of things for decades. Classes have changed their sizes. That's a key thing we have to remember. Back in the 50s and 60s, manual working class was the majority of the population. The middle class was quite small. Um, parties were struggling, like the Tories wanted to, oh, how can we win? You know, most voters are working class. It's different now. Certainly, say, 30% of voters would get classified as working class with this sort of procedure. Then there's a bunch in the middle, and then there's a very substantial professional managerial group that occupies, say, 40% or whatever. So on that point, can we go to the next slide? So if all those changes have happened in the last 25 years, why this goes back 20 or I think it goes back 30 years on, on this as well, um, why do we still identify the same as we always have done? So that, that graph shows that this, basically the same proportion of people say they're working class, the same proportion say they're middle class. Yeah, well, I produced this graph about a few years ago oh, with, that, no <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with John Mellon, a colleague. And, um, you know, actually, it's a puzzle. It's a puzzle for various reasons. One is you don't get this in America, you don't get this in Denmark, two very different countries where what we've seen over time is actually more people think they're middle class, fewer people think they're working class. Mm. It's clear that that's happening, and it, and it maps the actual occupational structure. In Britain, there's a resilience against actually being seen as middle class, and I have various theories about this, some of which are being tested, but none of which are certain. And it's in part to do with things like education, Having a degree used to buy you an insight, an inroad into a guaranteed professional middle class status that no longer does. So lots of people who have higher education nowadays still think they're pretty working class because they're not doing jobs they might have expected to do with higher education and they don't feel that they're advantaged. Um, at the same time, of course, they're vastly better off than people who don't have higher education, which they don't look at very closely. But if you don't have higher education, you can't even get on the first long of an interview ladder, never mind anything else. Forty years ago, you could. Mm. So, um, so the, change, the, the explosion of higher education and the growth of the jobs associated with those sorts of things means it's less special to be in those jobs now than it was I'm at one I'm really time. interested in that kind of huge phenomenon of the change in higher education. Maybe we can come back to that later. But I wanted to bring in, um, thank you, I wanted to bring in Vanda Wyporska, who's Chief, uh, Executive Director of the Equality Trust, so also knows a couple of things about this. Um, <laughs> That, that kind of top line question, and I think from what, what Jeffrey said then, there's, there's a kind of tension between the kind of reality of our changing fortunes and our kind of quite fixed identities. Um, 
how do you read that? I think it's really interesting. I mean, as, as <coughs> sorry, someone who grew up in a single parent working class family up in the northwest in the 70s, um, and having been privileged enough to get a scholarship to a private school and then go on and do a degree and then go on and do a doctorate at Oxford. I really struggle with this myself personally um, because, you know, we were briefly commenting on this, that I see myself very much as a, coming from a working class background, championing a lot of working class issues, saying, you know, we don't have to. Our, our vision of social mobility where we pluck out poor but bright kids and force them to be middle class and force them to be this homogenous group means that by definition we're saying that working class is bad. And I think maybe, you know, this is a totally untried hypothesis, <laughs> mm. totally personal, but I think there are a lot of us who actually resist being labelled as middle class because there is a loyalty to where you've grown up, there's a loyalty to your background, there's a loyalty. You know, my mum used to say to me, you know, I get upset if, if you say you're black because oh, my mum's white, because it means you know, it, it, it makes me feel disenfranchised. It makes me feel that I'm not part of you. And it's, it's these struggles of our identity that, you know, we are working class, but maybe living a middle class life. Um, and I think, you know, going back to the, the job status, you know, if you're, if you're CEO of a small charity, yes, you have the autonomy. Yes, you have all of these things, but it's pretty different. I can attest to this, to being CEO of Betfair 365 and earning 350 million a year, you know, or whatever they're earning. They, they're very, very, the jobs are very different. They're very flexible. They're very, um, they mean different things. But I think one of the things really is how do we self-identify? Um, and self-identification is something that cuts across all of these issues. Because when we're talking about class, we're also talking about the intersectionality of sexual orientation, of race, of gender, of all of these things. And I think, you know, finding those complex intersections and not making assumptions. You know, there are pointless, countless times where, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, this has happened to Pfizer as well, where we're discussing things like getting more black kids to Oxford. Well, you know, aside from the debate of whether this should be the main focus, but by blanketing and using the term black kids and underprivileged at the same time interchangeably which many commentators and many you know many people in the news talk about you're making those assumptions you know that there aren't black middle class people or that there aren't you know that all asian people are of a particular background all of these assumptions that are made and so i think it's such a complex issue but class is still not being looked at in terms of the anti-discrimination agendas that we see around some of the protected characteristics and the multiplicity of impact of that discrimination um, amongst all of those protected characteristics in and between is still a big issue to look at as well. Thank you. Um, at any point, if anyone wants to come in on any of these points, let's go. we've already had quite a lot of information to process, I think, but um, if anyone wants to join in, I've, we've got a friend at the back there. Um, I'd just like to pick up on that point about black children. Um, I was working with uh, Michaela Community School and the headmistress there, Catherine Burgelsing, and one of her core issues was to take black children from Lambeth and sort of aspire them with the idea of uh, the ability to get into Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, so she tried to set up a free school there and was blocked pretty much by everybody in the borough and the local authority and some of the local parents. She now opened her school in Wembley and she had the best GCSE results in the country this year. And she targeted specifically uh, black underprivileged um, and those on um, free school <coughs> meals, uh, specifically to the school. And they run it, uh, for a lot of people it's very didactic, it's incredibly authoritarian, but the children there absolutely adore it. We made a, uh, their, their school video because we were, we were tracking their progress, making the documentary about the progress of the school. Uh, and the children just kept saying time and time again that they were always told that they were never going to amount to anything because of the colour of their skin. And once somebody came and said, actually, you can achieve anything, their greatness just mm. grew It's so interesting to hear another example of the, the role of education and all of this. Sir, did you have something to say? Um, yeah, Paul Swain. <coughs> On the big picture, we're talking about middle class and working class. Um, does upper class still exist? Um, and if not, does that change the position of middle class, 
who previously felt that there was a ceiling above them, which if there's no upper class, there isn't. Who has another? Okay. Wait a minute, that's a question. <laughs> um, okay, you, you, you get points off, but um, I, it's a good question, isn't it? Um, upper class, what, does any of the panel have a view on this? Yeah, uh, yes, they do. They've been retaining and transmitting wealth by investing in everything from coal mines to all sorts of other things for the centuries, get the National Trust to keep them in their homes and all the rest of it. They're, you don't get them in surveys, funny enough. You can't get past the butler. <laughs> so you never find out much about them. Um, well, so you can't it's a very small group of people, and, and a big, you know, 65 million people, and a small number of people who hold the old aristocracy and connect people connected with them clearly still exist. And if you wander around the fields of Gloucestershire, you'll see the places. Mm -hmm. But are they perceived as a class? I mean, I think, it, I think we're very naive. It's very naive to, to think that the upper class doesn't exist anymore Are they relevant? because they're, they're extremely relevant because they still have more power and more wealth and they still have a say and it might not be that we see them as much we might see some you know some of them pop up we heard about a millionaire that's decided that um we should have we should put homeless people in in literal bins yesterday i don't know if you saw that story in the daily mirror he's come up with this idea to have two bins stuck together and those could be pods for homeless people. You know, occasionally you'll have the odd story like that come through, but ultimately you still have these. You look at books like um, Who Owns Britain? And these books are, and it's very hard to get the data and it feels like that's done on purpose. And what you see is that over time, it's the same family names that sit at the very top of society that we don't know very much about at all and um, sit in the background, but often are involved in um, lobbying companies, in donating to, to the right, the Conservative Party. Um, I think we're very naive to the extent to which the establishment still plays a very, you know, the establishment and, and the upper class are still very much entwined in places. And the, and the idea to say, like, the upper class doesn't really exist anymore is almost as if to say that there's no hi real hierarchy in society, and you can't be on the 20th Etonian Prime Minister. <laughs> At least a third of our Prime Ministers went to Eton, which is insane. It's a tiny school, right? And not think that there is an upper class. And that is the degree into which they've been able to get us to believe that the class system has broken down and changed in a way. In many ways, that part of it has been the same for centuries. Thank you, Pfizer. Did you want to come back on that? Well, uh, I yes, I, I, I would question your definition of someone who's got millions being upper yeah, class. Yeah. Of course, you know, uh, in, in, in the old upper class, it depended where your millions came from. Um, you know, and if it was in trade and, and, and such like, you were not upper class. No, so but then you have, the Grove, you have the Groveners, you have the De Wardens. I mean, you know, most of the property that we are sitting yeah. in now is owned by the old landed, landed gentry, and before yeah. that it was Oxford and Cambridge colleges, you know, where I live. Most of the streets are still named after colleges in Oxford and Cambridge because they owned the land in that part of London, and, and we're still talking owned. about... They still don't yeah. Exactly, yeah. you know, we're, talk, we're talking about land in London, not, you know, so fields John's outside Oxford. Or exactly. exactly. <laughs> Did I see some other hands, sir? Chandra, uh, Chandra Shra. I'd say that with the rise of the global billionaires in the last 20, 30, 40 years or whatever time, the so-called upper class who own all the land in this country, I mean, less than 10% own 70% of the land, they've chosen to hide, and hide themselves. They're no longer as prominent in terms of clubs and so on. You'll find clubs in St. James is closing because they don't come, you know, their lifestyle has changed. But they're still there. And one other thing I'd like to add. Uh, I went to uni in the 70s, and this handbook you've very kindly given us. I remember a tutorial in sociology, uh, which was a module then. It's not much different to what we did, we talked about in the 70s, yeah. Claudia at the back, who produced that lovely um, set of notes that you just referred to. Yeah, it's just about that, um, the point about upper class and aristocracy, and it is actually on page 22. Um, <laughs> um, it's just the point that, so if you take the historic aristocratic families, there's roughly 600 of them that still exist, and they still own 30% of land in England. Um, but also the value of that land and the value of arist like inherited aristocratic titles has gone up since the 70s and 80s, so now the average title is 
worth 16.1 million pounds, just in terms of like the value of that. So the so the the true upper class under the old deficient uh, definitions is now um, entrenched. Yeah, and so the the value of a title in between 78 and 87 was 4.2 million. So the value of it has actually gone up in the past. Yeah. Yeah. We go just over 20 minutes now, which mm. factors we've covered include race, mm -hmm. education, employment, self-identity, aristocracy and inheritance, land ownership, wealth. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that it very much does exist, but the factors by which it's divided are, are so broad, and mm -hmm. um, arguably as society changes so complex, that um, that's the struggle of this exercise, it seems. It's mm. just the multitude of factors and how they're changing and how we therefore try and pitch ourselves and identify ourselves and others within that far more complex matrix. Mm. Thank you. That's, that's a really good point, the, the oversimplicity. And Pfizer, who, who I should have introduced before, actually, um, Pfizer Shaheen, who is director of CLASS, which is a think tank who also knows quite a lot about this, um, um, has an alternative reading of, of CLASS that I would love you to talk about now because I think it talks to that point a bit more. And there's a slide that goes with this, Claudia. Yeah, so, okay, so I should say, so, um, I mean, I run a think tank called CLASS, so you can imagine that I'm quite <laughs> obsessed with it. But um, a few years ago, um, myself and the director of Running Me Trust, which is a race think tank, we just met for the first time, we were having a coffee, and we just got into this really deep conversation that we were both just getting very annoyed about this term white working class um, and the way in which we were seeing the working class being divided um, by race and by region even and we, we were just kind of frustrated about the tropes that were being created that were you know in, essentially very divisive um, and also at the same time pathologized the white working class into being like the racists and the you know the yobs or whatever and it was like so you know we were like, well, we need to kind of confront some of this narrative that is developing, that is mythology. Um, so we went out and, and got some funding and did some research, and we interviewed um, between 80 and 100 people, um, sort of broadly working class, uh, were defined mainly on lower incomes. And what we found were there was um, sort of four themes that kept coming up in these conversations. And the report is one of the sort of, sort of proudest things I am that I've ever been involved in, called We Are Ghosts. It's a quote taken from, from someone that we interviewed. Um, and that point, uh, we, we call it the four Ps, which you see on here. So, precariousness, power, place, and prejudice. Um, the point about precariousness is that people kept talking about whether it be about income, whether it be housing, whether it be their immigration status. It always felt like they were on the edge, that they you know, lived insecure lives. Um, that secondly, that they didn't have a lot of um, power in their lives or voice. And I think the way in which that is often captured is the conversation about what happened to um, people living in Grenfell Tower and the way in which they were ignored um, and, and in which their voice was just not seen as, um, as, as important or that should be taken seriously. Uh, even on Friday, I had a conversation with a local woman that's having some housing issues. And she was saying to me as well, and, and this gets onto the point about prejudice, is that like, why do they talk, why did the housing association talk to me like that? So all of these people that we were interviewing felt looked down upon and, and could talk about, unfortunately too often from the state, uh, the way in which they were treated that made them feel like they were smaller and less important than others in society. Um, and then finally, place. There's this real sense, especially, especially in like London where there's gentrification and people being pushed out of their place, this real commitment to their community and to their place, but feeling like that that is, is short term and that that's not really, they're not really allowed to have that connection with place because with any moment they could be pushed out um, and, and, and not allowed to, to live in that place anymore because, because they are working class, or they are lower income and they are, do live these precarious lives and you know the housing association can shift them off somewhere um, and or they can no longer afford to have to rent there um, and so you know these four themes just kept coming up so in a way when we're thinking about like the axes of which you would start judging some of the things around where you are on the class spectrum this this is quite important to understand i know that there's other things like the british class survey that look like things like culture and but we didn't really hear a lot about that until we asked the question at the end of the interview which was do you consider yourself working class 
And what was interesting at that point was that uh, black and Asian people or, or Middle Eastern people would say, um, oh, um, I can't be working class though, can I? Because I'm not white or I don't go to the pub. So those tropes about the working class have worked so well that people that were clearly working class weren't identifying as working class because you thought that was something for white people. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was, so, it was such an illuminate, illuminating piece of research in terms of how working class lives are lived. And often we have these conversations without actually having the conversation with people. And, um, you know, or it completely flew in the, uh, in the face of all of the, all of the tropes about, you know, the white working class versus immigrants when we just heard the same stories again and again. And if we spoke about those ways in which um, lives are actually the same, how we would, able to, we would be able to build um, solidarity. And this is one of the ways in which class, the idea of class has really changed. You know, working classness was used as something to build solidarity and to build power amongst, um, amongst the working class in order to fight the bosses or fight the upper class in which to kind of balance that off in society, especially with trade unions, etc. cetera. Um, but now it's a term used to massively divide and rule the working class. Um, and one final point that we thought about quite a lot in the research was not that just that we need to rethink the way in which we're talking about class because things have changed in terms of work and, and we're not understanding especially power and prejudice and how that's playing out, but also because actually for a long time we've thought about the working class as being white, right? This country has a history of empire. My great-grandmother used to work the fields in Fiji and she was taken as indentured labor to go and work sugar picking sugarcane. She was part of the British working class. The money that was made from her labor flew, came back ultimately to here, right? So we actually haven't had a good idea of what working classness is for a long time. So it's not just about remaking it, it's also like making up for the fact that we've always taken people out of color, people of color out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Um, it's interesting what you're saying, sorry, John James, um, what you're saying here, because it makes me start to question what do we want to do with our concepts of class? Um, and do we want, because I think old concepts of class are about, oh, I, I can relate to that person, it, it's about easing immediate um, social interactions. And I'm working class, or I'm, I'm upper class and that person's upper class, and, and therefore we can get on, and therefore we know what we're talking about. And I really don't think that's what we want to do with class these days, because I think people now are, much, are a bit more open to being like, oh, you're a person, I'm a person, let's kind of work out something else. We don't have to rely on certain... It doesn't really play out on the data, to be honest. The data shows that we just mix with people generally in our own socioeconomic circumstances. I'm saying what we want to do, yeah. not what we do do. I think that I, what we want to do. I know, but yeah, I, it's still not. <laughs> those are very, but, but, what we, but if we want to do something with a concept, then maybe as that concept changes, people will manage to do something different with the concept and therefore do different things. Mm -hmm. I, I um, can, uh, can I bring in Cash Carraway at this point, who is an author, um, author of the book Skin to Stay, who, who talks about her own experience of all of this? Um, yeah, I'm just, I was actually sitting here thinking, isn't it really weird how I'm afraid to speak? Oh, yeah. No, 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 not, not like, oh gosh, you're all going to say something terrible, you're going to think yeah. I'm really stupid. But I think when you start intellectualising class within um, an environment where someone who is working class and doesn't work within um, education. Think also, have I got, not got a microphone? Oh, that's not for, it, it's not for Oh, I see, sorry. <laughs> that's why I was mumbling. <laughs> um, now I'm in my place, you know? Um, I suddenly felt really scared to, to join in. And I think that it does come down to what you're saying about um, knowing your place in society. Um, and when a government is looking down this, and systematically abusing the working class when, the own, when our own Prime Minister calls our children illegitimate and says that we live depressing, monotonous little lives. I mean, how can you not be afraid to speak up in, that, in those kind of circumstances? Um, I feel so much confusion <laughs> around class. So much confusion, especially within this context as well, because I'm proud to be working class, and I imagine there's many people here who are also proud to be working class, but 
being proud to be working class, it's usually only something you can do once you've escaped it in some way. My life changed very dramatically. Um, I, six months, I mean, six months ago, I was living on a council estate. Um, a year before that, me and my daughter were living in a homeless hostel. The year before that, we were living in a women's refuge. Um, and you know, life has always been precarious. Um, so now I feel very confused about my aspirations. Um, but I feel <coughs> I'm allowed to be proud to be working class now because I suddenly have a bit of money. Suddenly I have a proper job. I don't, um, you know, I'm not working in a call centre or in a peep show. Um, so I think there is, I think, I think we are a discriminated group. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to articulate it when you're still kind of living within it, I find. And do you feel that people treat you differently now than they did six months ago, like oh, with your success? Yeah, and... people are lovely. <laughs> <laughs> people are so nice now, you know. Um, when you're... Well, there is, still, there is still an element of, of looking down. You do feel like you are the poverty form piece. Um, often I get calls from journalists wanting to tell my story. And I think a lot of working class people get that. Um, people wanting to tell their stories on their behalf. And that's, that's why I don't think the working class is articulated very well within the media, within television, um, within mainstream journalism. And it's because those, that our voices are generally owned by the middle class. So, um, so yeah, so I am I am treated differently to some extent, mm. but I think people still believe they can tell my story better than I can. Do you think you will always identify as working class? I don't think I have a choice. You know, when they sell the the, the film rights, I've sold and, them. And <laughs> <laughs> um, my voice, you can tell that I'm working class. You can you, you could probably tell by looking at me that I'm working class. Um, it's an aura <laughs> that, that you carry around. So I think I'll, I will always be forced to be working class. And I think a lot of working class people... I mean, how many times can I say working class in one sentence? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's something that stays with you forever. But also, I wouldn't want to be middle class. I couldn't mm. think of anything worse than being middle class. <laughs> Surely anything in the very it? middle is boring. <laughs> boring. Oh, I mean, the middle of anything. Yeah. It's just hell, yeah. isn't it? Hey, I'm a middle child. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, I mean, you, you have middle class... If you look at in, like, the music industry, you have a middle class artist pretending to be working class. If you look at Britpop in the, in the 90s, you have... Uh, um, when, when I first saw the question, uh, just a bit of fun, I immediately thought of um, Parklife mm. by Blur, you know, these middle class men appropriating uh, working class life in order to sell art. Mm. Um, people, the middle class are generally embarrassed to be middle class. They want to be the upper class, which does definitely exist. Um, <laughs> So they appropriate working class because it's cooler. Mm-hmm. You know, to be working class is cool. Just look at Common People by Pulp. You know, that's, <laughs> that sums up. That sums up the middle class approach to, to working class lives. Thank you, Cash. I'm going to come to the middle here. There's lots of hands, so we'll work our way around now. So, <coughs> I'm I'm John. Um, I was struck by your question and some of the interesting points that have been made later, where you asked have. Do you ever make judgments about someone because of the vocabulary they use? And I was thinking about the use of what you've chosen to call, or society has chosen to call, or some academic has chosen to call indicators of class, and what the use is. When when you are trying, when you are having in the course of a job to deal with people from a wide range of backgrounds, both foreign and within sectors within the UK of any number of kinds, you tend to listen to the way somebody's speaking to you, particularly the register they're using, the vocabulary they're using, as well as the sentence complexity, in order to be able to communicate with them better. If you don't do that, you sit across a table from them doing any kind of negotiation with them, recruiting them or trying to sell them something or buy something from them, and you're less effective. So I, 
I just got the slight impression that you were suggesting to listen, listen that listening to the way someone speaks to you is wrong. And I think it's actually very important in helping the relationship not to trip over itself earlier on. Mm. So I think that I think that's a really interesting point. And, and when at the end of that, wh who put their hands up for um, to say that who didn't put their hands up to the question? Do you ever judge people on class signifiers? Does anyone want to talk to that point about you know the idea that you don't judge class? Oh, sorry. Hello. Hi. Um, I think, I don't know if it's... Your name's Maeve, Maeve. isn't it? Yeah. Lovely. I don't know if it's the same, maybe because we're from a younger generation. <coughs> um, but we go to a school that is very middle class. It's a state school, but it's, the majority of people are middle class. But because of where we live, a lot of people have the stereotypical working class accent. Mm. Which means that no one in school really assumes that people are working class. Mm. They, like, it's, it's the class really isn't thing in our school it's judged on different things so I don't think in the younger generation people judge people or make assumptions on them based on how they speak in their vocabulary because of the way that the younger generation kind of tend to go for the working class accent as you were saying earlier that like um, it's kind of like this thing to be cool no one yeah there's not really a class to do with vocabulary in the so it, it might be because it's quite a middle class school but I'm, yes. I'm interested in kind of how people kind of define their identity then you know what what are the signals of identity within your school more <coughs> political stance mm. or maybe like the LGBT movement mm -hmm. is kind of growing and a lot of people find themselves in different areas in school due to their sexual orientation or Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Are there any other hands? Uh, Hans Backman. Um, you didn't actually ask us whether we judged people. You no. asked us whether we listened to yeah. what they did. Sorry. A really big difference between those two things. Yeah. Yeah. Not to put my hand up if you'd asked <laughs> <it. laughs> um, But I think accent is a massive thing here. Um, uh, I think accent outside London. Um, where do you go to school? Camden School for Girls, I'm wanting to guess. Where do you go? I just said that as well. Yeah, but where, where do you go to school? No, no. we're in Essex. Okay, whereabouts in Essex? <laughs> South London. Okay, so... Okay, but I went to Camden School for Girls, yeah. all right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, there's a really big difference between London, inner London, and particularly outside London in all of these things, I think, very big. But the accent point, and the other point is to do with things like names. Um, uh, I've been running a charity, I've got some colleagues here, we're all from Career Ready, um, and we work with young people in disadvantaged areas and we help them to really achieve their potential in the workplace. And if you look at the names of our children when they're applying for jobs, the names of our children are completely different from the names of children who will apply from posh schools. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if you look at addresses and postcodes and everything else, it means that in terms of recruitment, which is such a vital point at which people can not necessarily leave their class, because that's not what they need to do, but be the person they want to be, which is what we essentially, we don't want people to feel that class is holding them back from being who they want to be. There are judgments that are made about them by people who wouldn't intentionally be thinking they were making a judgment. Mm -hmm. And everything that they're putting down on those forms is going to tell a story, which is going to impact on their choices. And so we have... I think in this country, I don't really know, in America it doesn't work like this. You know, in America people are proud to be middle class, they want to be, they aspire to be, they even have a car called the Suburban, you never get away with that in England. You know. um, so, um, but, it, but here people are slightly sort of awkward about their middle classes, but <coughs> people who want to get on, don't think they necessarily want to change their class, but they want to get on and be as successful as they can be and have rewarding lives. And what happens at the moment is a mixture of class and snobbery, and people who've thought about this more than I have will, will know how those two things work better together. They stop that from happening. They limit what people can achieve. And that's the biggest problem about all of this, is that we are limiting the lives of people who could really achieve more if they wanted to, uh, and most people do. They want to be able to feel that they're not precarious, mm. that they actually can get the job that that they would like to get and that they have the skills to get and that they can lead fulfilling lives and feed their families. People have basically those, those instincts. And the, the things that are stopping them are often 
very, very small if you start listening like that, but very big in terms of impact. Mm. Can I jump in on that, please? Because you said some really interesting things there that really related to me. Um, my actual birth name is Kelly. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what you think, right? That's what I think when I hear that name, and I'm working class. Um, I, um, when I left university, I was applying for jobs, just office jobs, under the name Kelly. Nothing. Um, so I changed my name by deed poll to Camilla. <laughs> this is true, this is true. I mean, it's, um, and I, I got a job working for a hedge fund. <laughs> as, 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 in, in doing admin, I wasn't, I wasn't trading or anything. <laughs> but still, it, it was desirable for the CEO of that company to have a PA who was called Camilla. But it wouldn't have been desirable if I'd been called Kelly. Um, also, when I um, gave birth to my daughter back in um, 2010, I was living in Maida Vale, um, which is a very affluent part of West London. Um, again, um, gave the name Camilla to um, all the, the mums down the mums and, mum and baby group. I was so welcome, so welcome. And it's, um, I'm ashamed, ashamed of myself for doing it, but you don't get anywhere if you don't change. I mean, that's not uncommon. Like, so many people mm. have told me, uh, if you've got a Muslim sounding name or an African sounding yep. name in this country, you know, I, I had a friend who was applying for, um, like, law, like getting into solicitors to, to the law conversion or whatever, and, and she was getting nothing, and then she changed her very African sounding name to her dad's very English sounding name and immediately started getting interviews. And this is, yep. so this is the one of the ways in which, and I do think there's a bit of naivety that we all have we all constantly judge people. And I know we don't like to admit it, but we all have to watch our prejudices. We do judge people by the way that they look and the way that they talk. It's a constant thing, you know, and I think sometimes we act really defensively about these things, but the, the truth is, is that we, we do do it. I mean, I get like, um, I get a really annoying thing that happens to me, and I haven't been doing as much in the media lately, but it's just, because if I get, especially if I get passionate, I stop saying my T's, coming from a working class background. And so I get, on the one hand, I get people going, this girl can't speak properly, mm. you know, like having a go at me for being like that. And then on the other hand, I get people saying, she's pretending that she's from a working class background. <laughs> and it happens exactly, like I'll have a tweet, it'll be the same interview that they've watched. And, have, and I will try and sometimes like do both of them at the same time, go, do you want to talk to each other and work out? whether you're saying that I'm just like pretending to be working class or whether I am working class and whether there's something wrong with the way that I speak because I'm working class. And it's like, um, it's, it's just interesting how class, all, it always comes back to me. Like even, th even though I yeah, went to Oxford and have a PhD, like ultimately we, I'm still constantly judged by the way, and we all are, we all are, and we all have those prejudices inside of us. So that was really interesting coming back to John's point as well about um, about actually some of that prejudice is about forming human connection and understanding a person you're talking. Not necessarily pre prejudice, but the, the judgments you make when you meet someone and the connection you make. Is, is it ever useful, as John says? Is that how we form bonds with people? We find commonalities. No, it's the other, it's the other end. Um, it's, sorry, it's, it's the old school tie, and it's exactly what's used to establish that link um, of having that conversation of, oh, yeah, we both went to Oxford, which college, blah, blah, blah. And then you establish that you're, you're of a like um, situation. And given that, what is it, 7% of people go to independent schools, and yet the amount of judges, MPs, high-up people in the media, the power is concentrated in those hands. So... Going to Eton, going to, you know, whatever big public schools, Winchester, etc., um, is that passport, it's that secret signal. You know, it's not Masonic, it's pretty obvious mm. that you have these things in common and that you will be a safe pair of hands. Mm. Um, and conversely, the assumptions again are made that if you're not white, that you haven't had that experience and you haven't had that privilege. And even when you have, I mean, someone was tweeting the other day that, you know, they were, despite the doctorate, despite this and that, you know, people were still not taking them seriously on the subject they're looking at. Coming back to names, there's research to show that teachers, I'm sure you're aware, that teachers will mark lower 
kids that they think have working class names. Um, I mean, it, it really doesn't work with me because my name's Van der Vakorska, so when someone sees me coming through the door, it's like, okay, you know, I may well have benefited from a CV in that point. But it really is true because, as Fies was saying, we judge immediately. You know, my 10 year old son. I'm afraid to say it, you know, it's a terrible thing to say, but we'll judge somebody and be looking at their trainers. You know, these are things, we all do it in different ways, whether it's trainers, whether it's the way you're dressed, whether it's your haircut, whether it's the colour of your skin, whether it's these, these perceived class markers. Everybody does it and everybody makes that decision. And the problem is, is that that concentration of power that we were talking about is held within those upper classes. And it's going to stay there because what we're not talking about when we're talking about class is actually distributing that power. Because as long as we still have a class system and we still have the hierarchy and our aim for everybody is to go to Oxbridge, et cetera, et cetera, we're still all feeding into this system that is keeping that hierarchy going. Uh, can I just quickly say something? Yes, Sam. Um, I, I came Your in, name is Sam. My name is Sam, yeah. yes. Sam. Uh, I'm a black cab driver. Um, so I've always done a... I'm a middle-class person, you can probably tell by the way I speak, but I've always done a working-class job. Um, and this is not quite conversation I was expecting about class uh, when I came here this evening. Um, it, it's great to complain about Etonian Prime Ministers, but who's just voted in the most recent Etonian Prime Minister? It's the working class, isn't it? It's not just the working class. It's, you know, it's not majority either. But, I mean, yeah, it's it is the majority, working class. It is isn't it? It's an 80 seat majority. No, it wasn't majority working class. I mean, this is the way in which this mythology is reduced. So, Brexit, for instance, apparently that was majority working class. When you look at the numbers, mm. it wasn't. There was a large chunk of working class. Of course, the working class vote for Conservatives has gone up. In That's any vote, true. there are fixed positions and there are floating voters. Yeah, right? so and that they was the case in the referendum. Yes. And that was even more the case in the most recent election. And famously, they won an 80 seat majority because they got lots of seats in the north that they don't normally get, mm -hmm. which are normally safe Labour working class seats. Yeah. So it's great to have a conversation about not uh, being prejudiced against working class people mm -hmm. or not deciding that people are a certain way because of certain characteristics that they have. But you also have to think about why people <coughs> voted the way that they did. Um, why did they vote for the Tories this time around? Why did they vote for Brexit? I didn't vote for the Tories. I didn't vote for Brexit, right? But I know a lot of people who did, mm -hmm. and I don't see any of them sitting here today. Can I just and tell me what you think? I mean, you you, you know those people. What what's your what's your conversations with them that, that that you can tell us? So some of the class conversation has has changed. Uh, a lot of the people that I know voted uh, to leave the European Union because they see the European Union as the new kind of anti-working class thing. They see kind of corporatism, but also, uh, most importantly, statism, um, the, the idea of the, the, the controlling, unaccountable state uh, as, as the anti-working class thing. So, so I think that's a part of it. But also I think Labour scored a, a massive own goal, and I've sat in this room before and complained about uh, Labour's positions. Um, and I'm a Labour Party member, um, but but I do. I mean, they they really really wanted to have that working class vote, and they they kind of repelled a lot of those working class people because working class people are not necessarily socialists. Mm -hmm. So I is that this? Can I just uh, make a point? Sorry, uh, my name is Rose, and I'm a journalist. Um, and I think that the um, the point that you're making is I was in a pub and I was outside having a cigarette and there was two police officers having a chat about the election. And as a Labour voting middle class person, state school educator, like the mix like that everyone has I suppose and to some degree, I was really interesting, interested because I felt very much during the election like, after the election very like bereft and upset and but very aware of the fact the same after Brexit that there was this lack of understanding within the left and and within people about why people are choosing to vote and back different candidates or whatever. So I ended up chatting to these guys. <clears throat> it was really bad actually because they were like, you're not a journalist, are you? And I was like, no, 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 I'm not. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, we had this long chat and because I, I was like, tell me, tell me what, what was it? What was it when you went in there? Was it the manifestos? Was it the policies? Was it the person? Was it this, whatever? So they both voted Tory, and they were both, uh, they were like, you know, I'm a working class person, single mother family, 
Um, and I was like, well, did you know that Boris was slugging off single parent families, for instance? They were like, no, no, I didn't know that. And I was like, right, okay, but so what, what was it? And they said, well, while I was born into working classes, I've made something of myself, and I am now a middle class person. I believe I'm a, it's like an aspirational vote. So they found Labour's um, targeting of the working classes alienating because they didn't want to be working class anymore. So they voted for Tory because they wanted to be associated with the middle class. And I think that's a really huge thing that no one's talking about, is this aspirational vote that is um, tied in with people's own image of what they see themselves as versus what they want to be. Could I comment on You're, that? I'm, I'm just going to go to the gentleman at the back who I've seen and had his hand up for ages now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so my name, depending on who I'm talking to, is either Vince or Vincenzo. And I think that um, <laughs> what we were talking about before works both ways. Because I think in Downham, where I grew up, I was very much Vince for my own safety and for my own um, kind of feeling of belonging. Whereas in the working world, I'm more likely to be Vincenzo. I think that we can skirt around, <coughs> I'm actually, skirting is the wrong word. We can run around a load of different issues and call them class, but I think the hierarchies we feel in our lives uh, are replicated in so many different places, whether it's the workplace, there's a school, whether it's families in the communities. And they're, both alienating and reassuring because it gives you something to hold on to, but then to also recognise what you don't have. I worry that I worry that uh, people, unless they've gone to university, don't value their voice um, and don't have that space to say what it's like to be at the rough end of working class, uh, as well as those people who have might have seen themselves as middle class or even upper class and have fallen on difficult times and don't feel they're part of that. I, we talk a lot about social mobility, which sounds like it can go both ways. I wonder whether class goes both ways as well, where you can travel up the escalator and fall down the slide. I think the, the last thing I wanted to say, because um, it, it struck me as something that um, I don't know if we'll get to, is the appropriation of class where I don't know if you've gone to Oxford, you can call yourself working class. I went to Oxford and I'm, and I'm working class. And I don't feel like that. I'm legit, legitimised in feeling that way or even saying that outside. I know different people either say, actually, that's absolutely true, well done. And other people go, well, no, come on, you went to university, you're now middle class. I think it needs to be, I wonder what's justified in that kind of dis discussion where people are feeling like, no, you can't talk about being working class anymore because you've got a bit of money. Yeah. I'm going to hop through a few hands very quickly because we are running out of time. Lady at the back. Um, um, similar to one of the speakers, I did grow up in private boarding school through scholarship and bursary. So I wasn't, I wasn't part of the hierarchy of like family names and people who had unbelievable amounts of money. But I witnessed like food living with them since a very young age. They would mock the working class. And it would be like, once we would go to night, but once we would go to bed and the lights were off, they'd start like mocking the staff who were obviously working class and therefore living, and would put a voice on, would not pronounce their T's, or would make jokes like, oh, I go to shop at Tesco's. <laughs> like, it was bad. And obviously, having been on bursary and scholarship myself, I, I went to shop at Tesco's. <laughs> I didn't have that opportunity to have, like, food at my doorstep, like they did every day, and go on holidays every weekend. And it's that kind of... They kind of indoctrinate you into thinking that the lower classes are almost worthless and they mock you for it. And now I'm going to like a very good state school right now. And I'm incredibly happy because of the amount of diversity there. And it's like, if you go to private school, you, you get demeaned for not having money, for not being able to go on holiday. And it's that kind of thing that sticks in the back <coughs> of your like head. A bit better now. Thank yeah. you for that. 
Uh, my name is Romy, um, and I just wanted to, to share that uh, something like in this conversation, I feel there's a lot of um, talk about you know the upper class in a sense um, having this privilege and having this power. But I think by labeling the upper class also as one end of the stick, we stop having a proper discussion. And I think we brought it up earlier. So it's all about identity and, and class right now. Is in, in it's in a, it's it has to be redefined because the middle class has opened up so much over the last uh, twenty odd years, and as we've had from different people, um, the aspirations that people have are not just defined just by that class because it's so difficult to pinpoint what the middle class was previously defined as to today's society. Um, my grandparents migrated from East Africa, um, upper class in East Africa, to working class in the UK. However, what they found was in this country, the beauty was that they had an opportunity to rise up despite um, where they came from. And I think that's something that we have to celebrate about the UK and the people around us. And there are more people, especially younger generations, that are seeing that identity as a more individualistic thing. And hopefully if we can progress through that, that power distribution we talked about that was mentioned is, could be the solution. And we should, I think, feel stop bashing, because I went to boarding school as well. And I felt that everyone in the boarding school was so welcoming to everybody. So I, I, had, I was lucky to have a good experience, but I don't think the private education or people who are privileged should also be put down just because they were born into a situation. And they shouldn't feel guilty for being in a position of privilege, when, especially at a younger age. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to have to, the flag has gone up and Agatha has arrived. So. Um, we're going to have to wrap up at that point. At, at this point, and I think it comes to me to um, summarise the conversation we've just had. And I started off saying that I felt really confused about class today, and I feel more confused about <laughs> class today. Certainly, I feel like we've skipped through so many issues. The good news is that we are doing a, 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 this is part of a season where we can dig into some of these particular areas. Um, more kind of in a focused way in subsequent thinkings. And there was one thing I wanted to call out, kind of the elephant in the room as we're sat in Oxford Circus in our very nice newsroom. Um, this is quite a middle class kind of gathering um, because of where we are. This is a conversation that we will take um, through our tortoise locals at 10 places around the country which bring in very different audiences. And it's a conversation we'll take into our network which is how we diversify our membership. And we work with partner charities like Career Ready that Anne runs um, to really have this conversation with as many different people as possible. So you're one part in a puzzle to try and better understand this. Um, there were a few themes that really struck me that I think we'll take into our editorial discussions and, and talk about how we, can, how we can turn it into journalism and, and, and understand better. That tension between the reality in our shifting fortunes um, and um, our identities, that kind of very kind of stark difference there that um, Jeffrey and um, Emma talked about as well, um, is, is really, really interesting. I think Vincenzo slash Vince's experience of, of kind of the chameleon lifestyle really speaks to that kind of identity issue. And I think um, that's something that I, I would love to think about more. Um, the, um, the not being uh, working class because you're not white thing, you know, that's, that's a kind of a really penny drop moment for me on class and, and, and the idea of exploring that within the identity thing as well is, is I think really important. All the themes around prejudice from names to, um, well, the name one in particular to accents, I think there is ways we can journalistically test that. You know, we can we can go on and do some of those exercises of putting in applications and seeing how that comes back. So, you know, without getting too much into our detail, that I think that is something a really important area we could look into as a result of that. I had a, I had a kind of the the moment where I kind of I I felt most confused, but also strangely clarifying was was about you dropping your T's and getting it from both sides. And I had a moment when I thought, we are so screwed up about this. Um, so you've given us so much to take on in our journalism, but also to continue in the conversation and thinkings, which I hope you'll come back to, um, and um, out, outside of London as well, if you're there. Um, I need to say that Cash's book is on sale in the green room um, out the back there. So I'd encourage you all to go and get a copy. And, um, Thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate it.